A continuación eh, tenemos a Jeff Cantor eh, que nos va a hablar sobre Large Synoptic Survey te Telescope eh, Distributed Computing and uh, Networks, un gran telescopio de reconocimiento sinóptico eh, informática distribuida y redes. Eh, Jeff es el gerente senior de tecnología de información en la oficina de proyectos de Large Synoptic Survey Telescope responsable de tecnologías de información y comunicaciones, eh, maneja el desarrollo, operaciones y soporte de todos los sistemas de ITC eh, que permiten que operen los proyectos, los negocios y el observatorio. Como co gerente de cuentas técnicas de control es en, en, en el subsistema de gestión de datos, Can eh, Cantor también es el líder en la implementación de las redes de larga distancia que conectan sitios eh, del LSST en Chile, Estados Unidos y Francia. Entonces, eh, un aplauso para Jeff. Uh, come on, Jeff, please. It's your turn. Buenos días. <laughs> es un placer estar aquí, pero lo siento, no hablo mucho español, necesito presentar en inglés. So, I work for LSST, the Large Synoptic Telescope. Uh, this is a survey telescope, which is being built in Chile. And it's uh, optical, so it has mirrors and cameras and things like that. It's a large mirror, an 8.4 meter mirror. And, uh, as I said, it's a survey telescope, so we don't have a particular astronomer propose to look at some object in the sky, we just, like a big, enormous camera, just focus all over the sky and take pictures of the whole sky over and over and over again. We do this for 10 years from a mountaintop, Cerro Pachon, in uh, north central Chile. Not all the way up in the Atacama Desert, but uh, about four hours uh, north of Santiago. And uh, we're constructing it, as you can see from the picture there. Um, this uh, this uh, ground on the upper level up to the top of the dome is about five stories. So that gives you a uh, sense of the scale of the telescope. And we're supposed to begin our operations in late 2022. Um, I want to talk about the data that we take for a moment. The data is optical, so it's... Uh, You see a, an array there, that's our focal plane of charge couple photo uh, sensitive CCDs. And um, we look at the sky uh, roughly 10 square degrees in each picture. Each picture is 3.2 billion pixels. And each pixel is a couple of bytes compressed, four bytes uncompressed. So each single picture is 6.4 gigabytes of data. Okay. As an example, in order to display one of these pictures at full resolution, you would need 1,500 high-definition televisions. Another way of looking at it is, this is roughly the amount of data in one of the Game of Thrones movies. Okay. So it's a lot of data. We observe every night that we can when the weather is good, about 300 nights a year, about 10 hours a night. And that roughly generates about 15 terabytes of data per night. <laughs> Math that out and you get about seven petabytes per year. So it's a lot of, it's a lot of information, optical, optical astronomy information. Um, we're distributed across the world, or at least three continents, in terms of our operations. So you see down in South America, we have our observatory in Chile. We have a major data archiving and processing center in Champaign, Urbana, Illinois, in the United States. We have another processing center in Lyon, France, with the Particle Institute, uh, IN2P3 there, that processes part of our data. We have a, a headquarters site in Tucson, Arizona, where I'm from, which is hotter but not nearly as humid, and I'm really suffering. <laughs> um, and we have uh, where our camera comes from in Stanford, 
uh, in Palo Alto, California. And this is all connected by networks, uh, which is why I'm here. So when we first started uh, deciding how we were going to get the data, the traditional way of moving optical astronomy data in this time frame back in the um, early 2000s was to write it all to disk and ship it. And at the time, disks were not nearly the size that they are now, so we would have had to send, you know, 500 disks a night. This was clearly infeasible. So we naturally started to look at uh, high-speed fiber optic networks. So we went and first went to some commercial firms and asked them, well, we want a really, really big network. We want 10 gigabits per second between Chile and the United States. How much would that cost us? Yeah, we can do that for about $15 million, plus operating costs, blah, blah, blah. All right, well, that's a good number. Let's see if we can do better. Let's go talk to the NRENs. Let's go talk to Reuna. Let's go talk to RNP. Let's go talk to Clara. Let's go talk to Amlite and see what we can do better. And today, I'm happy to report that for about twice that $15 million, we're getting a minimum of 140 gigabits per second on each of our circuits, and in some cases, 300 uh, gigabits per second. Plus, we've built the network for our mountain to our base operations in Chile. So we, we, um, we knocked it out of the park in terms of bang for the buck. And the message there is there's a reason why the NRENs are there, and there's a tremendous value proposition. Tremendous value proposition. So how do we send that data? If you look down, you'll see at the bottom of this uh, slide is our base site. This is in um, uh, La Serena, which is about 70 kilometers away from the telescope, which you see as a picture in, uh, uh, there. Um, the 15 terabytes a night goes down. Uh, again, 100 gigabit per second class networks. Those are our own dedicated networks operated by Reuna. Um, and then we shoot that data all the way up to the archive site in Illinois, where we process it. And the interesting thing about the, uh, the nightly acquisition of the data is that we have a requirement to report to the entire astronomical community transient events, a supernova explosion, a gamma ray burst, things that are, that are short-term events that happen violently and suddenly in the, in the sky. We have to do that in 60 seconds of taking the picture. So we have to acquire the data, we have to take it down the mountain, take it all the way up to Illinois, process it, and send out these alerts in 60 seconds. So our transfer time is two seconds down the mountain, five seconds to Illinois, and the rest of the time is in processing. Okay? So this is our, our uh, driving requirement for fast networks uh, in, the, in the upbound direction. But we also, on an annual basis, we take all of the images that we've acquired since the beginning of the survey, and we process them with the latest algorithms so that we can get really exquisitely fine measurements of the various astronomical objects in the sky. As an example, by the time of, uh, of our 10-year survey is over, we'll be processing 70 petabytes of data in one year. That processing will let us look three, uh, 13 billion light years away, objects as distant as 13 billion light years away. So this is uh, roughly the, the age of the universe since the Big Bang is about 13.6 billion light years. And when you look at an object that was 13 billion light years away, that light left the object 13 billion years ago. So you're seeing it as it looked 13 billion years ago, today. So we can see the entire history of the evolution of the universe the basis of this LST study. It's an amazing uh, scientific uh, uh, achievement by the time we're finished. Of course, we haven't started yet. I'm just building it. But uh, it's, uh, it, we, we think it'll revolutionize things in the way that the Hubble revolutionized things in terms of uh, fantastic images of, of, 
um, astronomical objects. So, okay, so I mentioned we send out transient alerts uh, every 60 seconds. We send out the annual data products. Those data products form a what we call a data release, and that is what the astronomy community can use. Uh, it's stored on disks. We make it available in data centers uh, in both the United States and Chile, as well as some uh, potential data centers in Europe with our with our French and, and English partners. Uh, they haven't finalized their plans exactly about that. Um, so the, the timeline here, as I mentioned, um, if you look uh, right now, we are on a um, October 1st to September 30th fiscal year. So these are fiscal years at the top. Um, we're right now uh, ending the fiscal year 2019. We're in the last quarter of that. And you can see that we'll be uh, supporting in what we call an engineering first light. This is with a small camera, not the full-size camera, um, in 2021, and then full operations with the full camera in 2022. The networks are largely in place. So this is a schematic of the networks that we put in place in order to support the project. Um, we have from Cerro Pachon to La Serena, this is a dedicated um, LSST-only network. Uh, that uh, uh, starts there. Um, as you can see, we have multi uh, 100 gigabit per second. And you'll notice that of all the uh, lines between Cerro Pachon and Chicago, where our processing center is, and onto Champaign, the only line that doesn't have more than one path is from Cerro Pachon to La Serena on, our, on the Aura property and on the public highway. Um, we've looked at alternate paths many times, but we couldn't figure out a good way to, to put those in place. So we just put a high degree of reliability on that, on that link. Um, we have our own dedicated uh, people to support it, as well as reunit people supporting it. And um, we also have uh, data buffers in Cerro Pachon and La Serena in case uh, either of those links go down uh, there or beyond. We can buffer the data for about a week. And then we have capacity to move the data uh, in catch-up mode after the service is restored. Okay? But everywhere else you see both black and red lines. Those are primary and secondary links. So we've looked for path diversity in all of our network transfer transfers. So this way, if one link, if there's a fiber cut on one side, we automatically fail over to the other side from the red to the black, and we continue to send the data because we can't afford to get behind because the data volume is... Uh, and the data rate is so high. Um, so you can see the different uh, NRENs and carriers involved in all of these links. We recently concluded an agreement with ESNet in the United States uh, to provide service between Florida and, uh, actually between Atlanta and Chicago. Um, and um, we've done uh, a number of different, I'm not gonna go through the details. Those are just more detailed diagrams of the link. Um, obviously, this has come in stages as we've constructed it, um, and you can see that uh, on the right-hand side, uh, we have demonstrated now 100 gigabits per second b between Chile and the United States uh, at uh, our center in, in Illinois. So our first demonstration was in December of 2017 uh, at um, supercomputing, and we demonstrated uh, using essentially a lot of borrowed stuff, but using our, our, our uh, traffic points, um, we demonstrated about 44 gigabits per second, and then uh, about a year later, we demonstrated 100 gigabits per second. So this is, this is um, working pretty well, but because there are so many individual networking uh, operators in this path, we felt it's necessary that we try and make sure that these different providers operate as a single operating entity. So even though they are separate organizations, we're trying to unify them in terms of operations. And so the next phase of our development, uh, finishing off the last links that we have, is also to establish what we call the Virtual Network Operations Center. So network operating centers are used to collaborating with each other but we wanted to take it kind of the next step up. So we're trying to instrument all the networks with uh, Perf Sonar, Mad Dash, uh, other tools 
to allow us to have a complete weather map of the entire network available to all of the network entities as well as our operating centers um, in real time. So we're looking at um, techniques and technologies for uh, further automating the failover aspects of, of the path diversity so that um, the entire network is aware. Uh, technologies like uh, software-defined networking and um, interband network telemetry, INT. So these are, these are uh, technological vehicles that allow us to sense the state and health of all the different segments and operate unilaterally uh, and collaboratively as one network when we do failovers and recoveries. And you'll see that uh, the locations of the virtual network operating center sites, which form the full VNOC, are in fact the, the network operating center and the U LSST operating sites. Okay, so that's mostly what I wanted to talk about. Um, I thought I would leave the rest of the time for questions, if there are any. No questions. Okay. Thank you. Um, how do you uh, send so much data from Chile to Illinois? I mean, pentabytes over a fiber. I mean, how long does it take to get it there? So as I said, a, a single image, which is about uh, 12 gigabytes, we send within about five seconds. So we're, we're sending typically at a rate of about 40 gigabits per second. We have excess capacity. Um, to do that, we use uh, multiple data transfer nodes or, or servers on either end. Uh, for one image, we use 25 servers simultaneously feeding information onto the network um, and uh, correspondingly uh, a number of servers uh, reading it off the network as well. So the, the, the hard part is not actually the fiber optic transfer, uh, assuming there's no failover uh, issues going on, but it's actually the disk to network uh, data transfer rate. That's why we have to use so many servers to feed some, uh, information onto the network simultaneously. Did I answer your question? Thank you, Jeff. Uh, the question is, the data that you are producing is going to be open for the community? Or how is going to be... Yeah, so the question is, is the data open? So our, our agreements right now are that the transient alerts, the 60-second alerts, are immediately available worldwide, completely open. The data releases currently are available to the entire US community, the entire Chilean community, and European partners such as, excuse me, such as Leon that um, have contributed to the construction. We recently reached an agreement with the NSF where it looks like we're going to make all of the data releases open as well worldwide. Um, there is some, there, the original arrangement was that you had to contribute money to operations. Now you have to contribute some kind of in-kind or value added to operations. And this, is, this whole policy is brand new in the last month or two. And don't ask me for specific details about that. But I can point you to Bob Blum, who is our acting operations director, and he can give you uh, more information on that. I have tengo una pregunta. Uh, my question is: Is uh, in your in your experience in sort of engaging with the this community, essentially the GRAN community, right? What 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 worked what worked well in terms of how easy it was to figure out who you needed to speak with, and and uh, given that this is a significant global project, what could our community be doing better about supporting global projects? Yeah, that's so. a great question. So uh, I would say. Um, First off, we didn't start brand new ourselves. We, we leveraged 
existing relationships from my parent organization, Aura, and NRENS that had been carrying traffic from Chile to the United States for a number of years. So for Reuna and Amlite and so on, um, they were already um, oriented. They knew the players, they knew who we were, they knew the observatories, the structures, and so on. So it was a very seamless and natural evolution for us to leverage those relationships and just expand on them. Um, so in that sense, we weren't groundbreakers at all. Um, the other thing that's been very uh, valuable for us is um, Reuna and FIU also host an annual uh, coordination meeting called the South American Astronomy Coordination Committee. Okay. And they bring together the astronomy observatories in, in South America with the networks, Red Clara and so on, and we talk about needs and we talk about planning. And that works really well to get on the radar to understand where the initiatives are going, understand where we can collaborate across observatories to share data links and things like that. So those things have gone really, really well. Um, where things are, are, are not as um, well handled is what I was suggesting about the virtual knock having all of these different NRENs operate against one mission simultaneously with the same level of cybersecurity, the same level of monitoring, the same level of response, uh, responsiveness, and so on. So making the GREN a, a, a VREN, I don't know, whatever, but making it more tightly integrated in terms of operations, right. I think would be the, the growth area. That's, that's, that's good feedback. Uh, and if you if you have any kind of specific ideas about like tangibly we could start by doing A then then B then C that would really help us. I mean just off the cuff, uh, consistent uh, vehicles for monitoring performance for for looking at you know yeah, okay. out across the GREN to the other side, uh, those kinds of things would be very valuable. Una otra pregunta. Bueno, thank you very much. Un aplauso, por favor.